everybody, welcome to another video. Hope you're ready to flex those brain muscles. In this video, we're gonna graph some sine functions. First, we're gonna graph y equals sine x. We'd call this just the parent function for sine. We're gonna graph this and see what it looks like. Then we're gonna graph a couple harder examples for sine functions using transformations. And we'll even come up with a general formula of how we can graph any sine function using transformations. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's graph this y equals sine x. I can use a table to graph any function if I just uh, plug in things for x and then I have coordinate pairs and I can plot these, right? You can use this to graph any function. It's not always the most um, convenient or the most efficient way, but we can do it. So I'm going to pick x's. I'm going to be smart and clever about this because I want to pick x's. I don't want to pick like negative 1, 2, 5, things like that because then I have to use a calculator and I have to get an estimation. I'm going to pick x's that are sine values that I know, like 0. Sine of zero, I know that. Sine of pi over two, pi, I know those kind of things. So I'm actually gonna pick zero, pi over two, pi, three pi over two, and as you can see, I'm starting at zero and I'm going in increments of pi over two. Two pi, and that's where I'm gonna stop at two pi. And I'm gonna plug these in and get values for y and plot all these on the graph here. So when I plug in zero, what is the sine of zero? Well, let's see, sine of zero, my y is zero, so that means that that's actually just zero. So we actually start here at zero, zero. Zero, zero. Sine of pi over two, well, my y is one, and if you, these are all quadrantal angles, by the way. You can draw a little y-axis and an x-axis. Think about being here for zero, right? y is zero. What about being here? y is one, so that means this is just one. What about here at pi? y is zero again, so this is back to zero. Three pi over two. y is negative one, so now we're down to negative one. Two pi, that's the same as zero. Well, the same sign value, right? That's back to zero. So we can plot all these, and I'm going to be smart about labeling my graph as well. I'm not going to label it one, two, three, four, five, obviously. I'm going to label it in these increments of pi over 2, right? So I'm starting at 0, all right, 0 down here, and then I have uh, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi, okay? And I'm going to label these in just a second. I want to draw, actually, my points first. So I have pi over 2, 1. So I'm going to do 1 up here and negative 1 down here, pi over 2, 1, and then I'm back down to pi, I'm back down to 0 at pi, then I'm back down to negative 1, and then I'm back up to 0. And some of you may know what this already looks like. You actually, you know, maybe it would be tempting to draw straight lines through here, but this is not straight lines. These are actually curves, and if you've heard the term sine wave or uh, something like that, then you, you probably, that's what you expect it to be, like a wavy curve, right? And you would be right if that's what you expected. So it is a curve. It does look something like this, and my graph's not gonna be perfect. Let's see if I can fix this part. I try to make it perfect, but it never is. So, coming back up. So it looks something like this for sine, okay? And this is the parent function for sine. And again, I can go in, and the reason I didn't label these right off the bat is because sometimes you end up labeling, and I put a label like here, and then I have to draw a line through the label. So that's just the reason why. So that's pi. This is 3 pi over 2, and this is 2 pi. And look what happens if I continue. Think about it. 2 pi, if I add pi over 2 to that, I get back up here to 1. If I add pi over 2 to that, I get back down here to 0, and I get back down to negative 1. This process just repeats. This repeats, and it keeps going on forever, okay? And it repeats this way as well, and it keeps going on forever. So what I usually call these five points, we have five points I call these critical points, and some textbooks use that term as well. I call these the critical points for our sine graph. And the reason why they're so important is because these five critical points make up one period for sine. We call this a period. And this is probably not the textbook definition, but the way I think a period is how long it takes for the sine graph to go until it starts repeating itself again. So like we just determined, this is going to start repeating itself from here on. So that means from here, this point at zero, to this point at 2 pi, we have one period. So we'd actually say our period is 2 pi. Okay, period, whoops. Period equals 2 pi. 
And since we are we are actually oscillating, oh, I forgot to label my y. This is one, this is negative one. So we are oscillating, we're going up to one, down to negative one, up to one, down to negative one, and we keep doing that forever. So we never get below negative one and we never get above one. So we can see that the range is from negative one to one, the range of sine, right? And what else can we notice? Well, we call this number one actually the amplitude. The amplitude, this is this, uh, this is a vocabulary word when, when graphing sine and cosine functions that we use. And basically what it means is the distance from the midline to the highest or lowest point, okay? Because with sine and cosine, that will be the same. So the midline in this case is that line y equals zero, or you can think of it as the x-axis is the midline. And this distance is one up to the maximum, and this distance down to the minimum is one as well. So we'd say our amplitude is one. And this amplitude is always a positive number. This amplitude is always a positive number because again, we can think of it as a distance, it's positive. So even if there's, for some, well, we'll see how that works in a second, I'm getting ahead of myself. But we have a period of two pi, an amplitude of one. And I think that's all we really need to know about this parent function for sine. And we're gonna go and graph a couple transformations and see how that works and compare it to this. All right, so let's look at a general formula we can use to graph any sine function, and let's see what this stuff means. Amplitude, we have absolute value of A, period, two pi over B, phase shift, C over B, vertical shift, D. So what does this stuff mean? Well, amplitude, we decided amplitude was one for our parent function, which makes sense because there's like an invisible one being multiplied out in front of sine. What amplitude really is, think about it. Remember when we graphed quadratics, we can relate all of this to stuff we already know by thinking back to college algebra when we graphed quadratics, okay? Remember when you multiplied by something, it vertically stretched or compressed depending on if it was less than one or greater than one? Well, that's the same idea here. With our amplitude, what this is is a vertical stretch or compression. And it just depends on what the A is out in front. We just call it something else. We call it amplitude when we're dealing with trig functions instead of calling it vertical stretch or compression. But that's exactly what it is. Period, this is a horizontal stretch or compression. Think about it. If I go from a period of 2 pi to a period of pi, I have horizontally compressed, right? So that's exactly what period is. We just call it period, again, because we have these uh, sine functions that are just repeating, so we call it period. Phase shift. This is basically just a horizontal shift. Remember when we subtract, we shift to the right. When we add, we shift to the left. Same thing, vertical shift, we've already seen this. When we add out here, it shifts either up or if we subtract, it shifts down. So all this should look familiar. We just have some new vocabulary in here. But this should be a little bit familiar if you're a little bit familiar with uh, graphing quadratics and stuff. So let's go ahead and look at an example. Y equals two sine X minus one. We'll graph this example and one more example for this video, and then I may make another video graphing some harder examples and just doing a bunch of different graphs and stuff. But we're just gonna notice how, in this case, our A is not one, okay? So we do have an amplitude that is actually two in this case. So our amplitude is two. Amplitude is two. Our period is still the same. Period equals two pi, it's still the same. Phase shift, no phase shift, vertical shift, down one unit, shift down one. Shift down one unit. Okay, so since I'm shifting down, where am I starting? Sine normally starts at zero, zero. So now I'm starting at zero, negative one, right down here. So now what this actually does, the way I would think of this, is this shifts the midline. Always think of it in terms of midline because it can get really confusing when we have a reflection, we have, a, when we have all these going on all at once. Oh, and I forgot to mention that. If we have a negative out here, we reflect over the midline, okay? If we have a negative, since we're, we're not considering the fact that this is negative because of the absolute value here. So when we have a negative out in front, it is still a reflection. We have seen that with graphing quadratics as well. So, uh... I'll write a little note here. If A is less than zero, reflect over midline. Reflect over midline. Sorry about that. We won't do an example in this video of that, but 
That's exactly what happens. You reflect over the midline. So in the case of sine, instead of opening up, you would open down, if that makes sense, okay? So we're shifting down one unit. Our period is still two pi. And that's the cool thing about drawing the graph of these is I have complete control over what I label my points as, right? So I can draw all these labels and if my period has changed, all I have to do is change what they're labeled as, right? So I have the critical points, 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi. Um, and since we're down here at negative 1, my amplitude is 2. So I actually need to extend my graph a little further. I need to be like down here. Because as you can see, my amplitude is 2. My new midline is negative 1. You can even sometimes draw a dotted line for the midline. My new midline is negative 1, so that means I'm going to be have a maximum at 1 and a minimum at negative 3 since I'm oscillating the distance from the midline to the maximum and minimum. That's what my amplitude is, remember? Since it's 2, then I'm going to be up here at 1, down here at negative 3. So I can simply copy that down, actually, since my period hasn't changed, I haven't shifted horizontally at all, I can just draw my points like this. Draw a point here, down here at negative 3. Back up here, all right, and then I just draw my curves. All right, and that's a pretty rough sketch, but if I label my points here, I have negative three down here, negative one, one. This is pi, this is two pi, this is three pi over two, pi over two, and this is a pretty good sketch of this graph. Okay, so again, what changed? Well, I shifted down, so my midline shifted. That's what we're oscillating about, the midline. Period stayed the same. Amplitude changed. Okay, so this is a good example. I'll do one more example, then we'll end the video. All right, so we're going to graph another sine function, y equals sine of 2x minus pi. So now we got some different stuff going on. We're going to have a change in our period, and we're going to have a phase shift as well. So our amplitude is still 1. Amplitude hasn't changed. Amplitude equals 1, but we have a new period. Our B in this case is 2, so our new period is pi. Okay, our period equals pi. What about our phase shift? Well, our phase shift is not C, but C divided by B. And by the way, the reason why, I can show the reason why, is because this, let's see, Y equals sine. We can actually factor the 2 out in front, and we're left with X minus, let's see, when I put the 2 back in, I have to get pi, so it's pi over 2. So that's what we could rewrite this as, and then we could clearly see that the shift is pi over 2. Okay, so some instructors actually even teach like this, just to rewrite it like this, and then use this as the shift. These are two different ways to do it. Uh, either way, they're pretty much the same thing. We're going to end up dividing by b, that's exactly what I did here, is divided by b, divided by 2, right? So... Our new, let's see, no, not our new period. Our phase shift, phase shift is what? So I guess I could just write pi over 2, but I'm going to actually be real specific. I'm going to shift right pi over 2. Right. Technically, positive implies that it shifts right, I guess, and then negative implies left, but I always be specific. Uh, vertical, there's no vertical shift, so we're good here with our amplitude of 1, period of pi, phase shift right, pi over 2. So, again, we have an advantage because we can just draw the graph from scratch. This is actually better for us because one period is of length pi, and since I've shifted right pi over 2, instead of starting at 0, I'm going to start over here at pi over 2. And since one period is pi, that means if I take pi over 2 and I add pi which actually gets me at 3 pi over 2, that's going to be the, the end. That's going to be the last x coordinate for my uh, full period. Okay, so we know our first point is pi over 2. And our last point is what? 3 pi over 2, because I just added pi, because that's the length of a period. Now the first thing I do is I find the point directly in between. This is the process, and this is why with phase shifts, you have to do this, and this is the trickiest part of graphing these. And when it shifts backwards, it gets even more tricky. But what I always do is I graph, again, we have five critical points. You can get the first one just based on the phase shift. You can get the last one just based on the period and adding the period. Okay, you can get the middle one by basically adding these and dividing by two. You can think of it as taking the average. 
Sometimes you can as well just think of what's halfway between pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. In this case, I can actually pretty clearly see that it's 2 pi over 2, which is just pi. But I could have added these two as well and divided by 2. 3 pi over 2 plus pi over 2, that's 4 pi over 2. Divided by 2, that's 4 pi over 4, which gives me that pi. Either way, it works. When the numbers get more complicated, it may help to add them and divide by 2. So now I get these intermediate critical points, right, because I have 5 total. And I can do the same process. What's so halfway between pi over 2 and pi? Well, let's see. Pi over 2 and pi. Halfway between pi over 2 and pi. I think that's 3 pi over 4, okay? Because think about it. We have 1 half pi. We have a full pi. So 3 quarters of a pi would be halfway in between. 3 pi over 4. And now in this case, I think as well, we have 5 pi over 4. But I'm actually going to double check these answers. I'm going to double check this answer. So I have pi, which is 2 pi over 2. I'm just getting a common denominator because I'm adding these. Plus 3 pi over 2 equals 5 pi over 2. Dividing by 2 is like multiplying by 1 half. So that gives me 5 pi over 4. So my answer does check out. These are our critical values. Okay, our amplitude is still 1. Our period, we actually got everything we needed to get. We're still starting at 0 because we don't have any vertical shift. Our amplitude is still the same, so we're still going up to 1. Right, so we're going up to 1 and then down to 0 again. And then we're going down to negative 1. Down to negative 1 and back up to 0. So our graph looks something like this. Up, down, something like that, right? And this is the graph of, this is just one period. These continue forever both ways. This is one period of sine 2x minus pi. So again, I may make another video where I do a bunch of examples because there are a lot of examples. There's a lot of different stuff I would like to show, especially with the reflections. I'm going to get all these different shifts all at once, but uh, just because of time, basically, um, I'm going to make that a little bit down the road. So hope this video helped everybody. Make sure to hit like, hit subscribe, leave comments below with any questions, and I'll see you in the next video. Keep flexing those brain muscles.